من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خبيب قلوبنا وشفيء ذنوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا أبو القاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين ولعنة الله على عدائهم أجمعين إلى قيام يوم الدين رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقطة من لساني يفقه قولي The topic about توكل and how we see instances of this trust in Allah by Imam Hussein. It's a great lesson to learn. And there are several other lessons that we can learn as well. One of the things that we see is a vision. There was a vision for what the Qiyam and revolution of Imam Hussein meant. When you set out to do something big, you think about, at the end, what is the result that I would like to achieve? What am I trying to get to by doing this action? When the month of Ramadan started, for example, you set some goals for what it is that you would like to achieve. Where do you want to get to, get to after all of the fasting, the prayers, staying up all night and foregoing and being hungry, all of these things you had to set for yourself a goal. What am I trying to achieve? There was a goal for Islam in Imam Hussein's revolution. Part of this goal was to keep Islam safe for all of humanity. And if you think about what would have happened if we did not have the message of Imam Hussein right now. There would not be any majlis right now. There would not be any, I would not be here speaking, you would not be here. Maybe that love, that ish for the Ahlul Bayt would not be in our hearts if it was not for this event and this inqilab and revolution of Imam Hussein If that didn't happen, would all of the world, the followers of the Ahlul Bayt be connected to each other the way that they are? Everyone remembering on the same nights these events it brought together a unity for all of the Muslims. So there was a vision and a goal that Imam Hussein saw that maybe some of the people they didn't see. Some people they thought it's easier if we just do bay'at with Yazid, that would be easier for the Muslims. And Imam Hussein can continue to live and same for his family and there would no, be no need for this bloodshed. No need for all of these people to become shaheed. But what Imam Hussein was looking at was not what was right in front of him but also what was all around him affecting all of the Muslim world at that time and what would affect all of the Muslims that would come after him. All of the generations that would come after him. Imam Hussein alayhi salam was so kind and compassionate that he was thinking about you and I at that time. Imagine that he was so considerate that he said, I need this religion to reach those mu'mineen who are not even born yet. So this sacrifice that he made was with a vision and a goal, which was a very long-term goal. When we look at certain events that are happening in the world today, we see 
corruption, injustice, dhul, we see some people on the wrong side. And obviously someone has to be on the right side to stand up against them. The same message of freedom that Imam Hussein stood for is that same message that we stand for today. If we look at the, as I mentioned before, the, uh, as uh, Shaykh Mutahari mentioned, that the Shimr of Imam Hussein is already said, Salapishmurde, Shimr of Ruzito Bishnas. Know who is that enemy of yours today. Know who is that person that is doing that injustice. Because this was part of the vision and the basirat and insight of Imam Hussein when he had this revolution. That he was thinking long, long and far in advance. Much into the future. And how this would affect uh, everyone. So the point that uh, I want to get to, and also we can see uh, in the wisdom and the basira, the insight that someone like Imam Khomeini had. When that revolution, and I don't like to refer to it as the Iranian revolution, simply because it was a revolution for Islam, and so many people in the world benefited from that revolution. Even though it took place in Iran, it was a revolution for the sake of Islam and benefited all of Islam and all of humanity. Everyone who was Muslim benefited. The, when he made the day of Quds a day to be recognized throughout the entire Muslim world, I want to bring your attention to something. There is a reason why that day uh, was chosen for that specific area or that specific instance and why he did not say that there's going to be a day for some other places. And there's been people and Muslims dying in all parts of the Muslim world, innocent people. You name the country, Yemen, Iraq, Afghanistan, you can name any of these countries and they have suffered in all kinds of ways. We look at the turmoil in Syria today. All of these places, they have had different sufferings and different problems. However, why is it that this place, Imam felt that it was necessary and important to be recognized by the world? See, this is where you can see the wisdom and insight of a leader. Where he's not just pointing to something for today the problem that's for today, he's pointing at something that's going to remain a problem for some time. That so many years into the future, this is still a problem. So there was a vision in what he said as to why this needs to be something that Muslims recognize today as being a problem. Zionism is an enemy of Islam. It's an enemy of humanity. So when he set this as, as such, he made it a vision. He didn't say that just specifically there's people dying and being killed in Pakistan. They're targeting Muslims who are Shia. And all of these places that these incidents are happening, it is sad, it is unfortunate, it is tragic. However, there is a reason and a wisdom and why none of these other places were designated as to have their own day. And this is what's important. And there was a vision attached to that. Now let's move forward today. What vision do we have for Islam in this country? What vision do we have for our communities? Do we even have a vision for ourselves? Do we have a vision for our family? This is a great, I cannot put enough 
ta'kid and emphasis on the importance of having a goal and a vision. Sometimes people, they have the love to do something. They have the energy to do something. But they don't have the goal. We want to stand up against oppression. Okay, how are you going to do that? Where are you trying to go? What is the goal that you would like to reach? What is the vision that you have? Vision doesn't mean for one event or two events. It's a long-term plan for the next five years, for the next ten years. People who fail to plan eventually get to a situation where they're in a lot of difficulty. Sometimes there's difficulty even when you do plan. So it's a, a serious vavela and, and, and it's a serious musibad when you don't plan. Then what are you going to do? You have no idea where you're going. You have no plan. Nobody gets into their car and says, let's just go. Let's put our foot on the gas and go. Well, where? Where is our goal? Where is our destination? How will we get there? Well, let's turn. We want to go here. We use this, this method of GPS to get there. We have a goal. We have a way to get there. And the reason why I think that this is important because there's a lesson about the uh, presence of youth in Karbala. The presence of children and the future of them, Islamic Ummah in Karbala, supporting Imam Hussein. And there's always been people, young in age, who are supporters of the truth and what's right. Why this is important, I will give you an example. Probably, at least during the time when I was growing up, and there weren't many Shia centers, uh, there was not really a place that we can say was a Shia center in our city, in Philadelphia. So we would go to another city to remember Imam Hussein during the uh, ayam and days of, uh, of Ashura, the first ten nights, and throughout Muharram. There were some centers that be came about during that time. Uh, a lot of centers, different is, uh, establishments, some uh, masajid. These places that came about, their goal was to uh, have a little piece of the culture that they had brought with them, whether it be uh, Iranian culture, Arab culture, or Pakistani, Indo-Pak culture, to bring this with them and to maintain this and to preserve the culture that they had. Culture has its role and place in Islam and its importance. But there wasn't a vision along with this. So what happened in majority of places was that these centers were established. And the medium of communication, the programs were all in Urdu, or they were in Farsi, or they were in Arabic, or in some places they may have been in Turkish even. But they were in another language. So what happened when they didn't plan? Suddenly, the children who were growing up here, who were learning this language, who their mother tongue was English, they were slightly disconnected from the cultural aspects that were brought here. If you didn't plan for a vision that there needs to be something for the future of the community, then you're going to be in trouble. So consequently now we have a high rise and we're seeing a demand for the need for uh, English programs. Because of the youth growing up here, because of the uh, many converts and people who are coming to Islam, 
And also because of the diversity of communities a lot of times. Where there's people from all different backgrounds that understand different languages and their medium of communication is probably English. But what happened when people did not plan is that they came to this big difficulty and adjusting has been a difficulty. I see a lot of communities today throughout the United States, in Europe, a lot of communities that they're missing a whole age range of people. It's not like most communities, this is not a uh, every single place, most places, there will be a gap in ages. There will be a space where there's not a lot of youth of this age group. As if they're missing this a lot of times. Sometimes there's, for example, there's communities, there's people who are older there, and then there's people who are very, very young. But that middle age group of the teenagers and the young adults are sometimes missing. And there's obviously a reason for that if things were not planned for them. If I didn't plan for this person or this child or that, that age range, then I may have lost them and made it more difficult. So the great lesson in that is that there is an important uh, uh, vision that has to be attached with your community. If you have a community, you need to have a vision. You need to have a goal. I'm going to do repetition Tikrar and just doing things over and over again, this is not a goal. This is a band-aid. It solves the problem for a little while. It's not a cure. To fix the problem, you need to think, in the next 10 years, what will be the needs of the community here? In the next 20 years, what will be the needs of the community here? What challenges might they face? How can we prepare for that that's coming for them in the future? The same way that Imam Hussein prepared you all. He prepared all of us with that message of standing up against injustice. That message of sacrifice. That message of patience, endurance, forbearance. The message of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah Ali It's mentioned since in talking about the importance of youth and we see so many people who were young and very brave in Karbala, the Qasims, the Ali Akbars, the Ali Askars, the Aun and Muhammad, all of these people who were young. It even mentions names of people whose names are not known in history. It's accounts of people who were anonymous, nationals, but they were people who, young people, who fought for what was right. We have to do something in order to reach that vision. There's the way that we can reach that is we have to invest. We have to invest in our youth. We have to invest in the future of our communities. You know how people do property investment? They see a place, oh, this is a good place. Let me buy this now while the prices are low so that I can have something when the prices go up, when it's more valuable, when it's more needed. Or let me take advantage of this place that's not being used. Let me invest in it. I put some energy, some work, some time into something, and I get the results from that. I make my uh, investment in that. And if we invest in our youth, then the results are incredible. If there, when the revolution was going to happen, when they were asking, well, who are the people who are going to fight this war? Who are the people who are going to be standing up? What did Imam tell them? He said, they're still in their cradles. They're the youth. 
They're going to be the future of this Ummah. They're going to be the people who are standing up. So many people were young boys who went to the battlefield. I remember one uh, of the lieutenants in the army. He was talking about his experience and what happened during the Iran-Iraq war. And what he said was that there was one boy there, he was younger than everyone else in this particular group. They reached a place while they're in the enemy territory. They reached an area where there was the uh, barbed wire and they couldn't really move forward. And it was dangerous. So they were thinking about which, what to do at that time. And this young boy, he took his body, he threw it on these barbed wires. That he put his body on these wires and he laid on it to make himself his own body as a bridge and told the soldiers to walk over me. And he said that we had tears in our eyes. And he said, it's an honor to walk on me. And you find why some of the shahada, they say, I want to be buried in a place where people, those people who are uh, pilgrims and they're zahirin, that they put their feet on me. These young, brave people with this kind of uh, uh, sincerity and ikhlas, Look what they can do. They can have a revolution. They can change a whole country. They can change the whole world. We have to invest in our youth. We need serious Sarmaya Ghazari for our youth. We need to make sure that their education is at a high level. Their Islamic education is at a high level. They understand their uh, uh, ahkam for themselves. They understand their aqaid and the belief system that they need to have. They understand the message of Imam Hussein. They are the people who then, when they're firm in their beliefs, you start to give them responsibility. So you find like in history, the, uh, 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 some of the times the people were young who were leaders. Right? The army of, uh, uh, of Osama, the Jaysh Osama, he was a young person. And all of these people in history uh, uh, during the time of Prophet, these were a lot of times young people who were molded and taught and they were invested in. And now they're able to lead an army. Now they're not the ones following, now they are the leaders. How do we make these leaders? We have to invest in the youth. Salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. One of the ways that we do this is through ta'aleem and education, through teaching. There's a hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. من تعلم في شباب كان بمنزلة الرسم في الحجر. The person who teaches or the learning that a person does while they're young is like engraving on a stone. When you engrave something on a stone, it's going to stay there forever. ومن تعلم وهو كبير when someone goes to learn and they're older, sometimes it's more difficult. It says, "Kana bimanzilatil kitab ala wajin," writing on water. Obviously, if you try to write on water, it doesn't stay. It's just it becomes much more difficult. So this means that while I can engrave, while I can put these ideas and concepts into 
the mind of a young person, I have to invest and do that. Sometimes people, <coughs> they ask me, why is it that I speak Farsi so well? And I don't think I speak that well, but the perception or the wrong perception is that I speak Farsi well. So one of the things or the reasons that if I have any barakat in doing this, speaking this language well, it is definitely because of Hazrat Masuma. Salam alayha. And the many blessings that she has put in my life. And also because at a very young age, my parents felt that it was beneficial and it would benefit us to be able to be in this environment. So learning at a young age, it became something that was very easy. We learned very quickly and it remained a part of me. I think that after our first time I came back from Iran, I probably didn't speak a word of Farsi for almost seven years. But I didn't forget even a single thing. The things that I learned in the Hosea at that time, it seems like I was sitting there right now when I think about it, as if I was sitting in the classroom right then, I can hear word for word the things that my teachers were saying. Invest in your youth. It can make a difference in uh, the community and the vision, the future that the community has. I think that's all the time that we have for today, but inshallah Allah give us all tawfiq that our communities can be strong and prepared for the Imam of our time. Let's close with Dua Faraj. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Allahumma kulli malika hujjatil min al-hasan salawatuka